I am Al Gore. I used to be the next president. <laughs> I am a recovering politician now, uh, and it is uh, truly a, a great honor to be here with you, uh, especially because this is a, an audience of librarians uh, and educators, reading assistants, and, and those who uh, appreciate books and who understand uh, what, what role books play in our country and in our civilization. Um, we are meeting uh, in this great city, which is renowned as a, a center of reading and learning. And I, I had the, uh, uh, the great opportunity to, uh, to go to college in, in this city. There are more than 40 colleges in this city, and it has a, a, a not, I started to say unique. Well, it is unique, uh, but it's such a wonderful um, atmosphere and such a wonderful place to learn. We are also uh, meeting in the aftermath uh, of the Copenhagen Conference uh, in December, and uh, I was with a group of environmentalists recently uh, at which the question was asked to uh, one of my colleagues, uh, how do you feel about Copenhagen? And one of them said, well, I feel fine. And I immediately thought of an old story that I first heard as a young congressman uh, in Middle Tennessee when I represented a, a largely agricultural district running from the Kentucky border to the Alabama border, 25 counties, 10,000 square miles, across which I used to travel every weekend having town hall meetings. And one Saturday night late, I was driving back to my home in Carthage, Tennessee, listening on the car radio to the Grand Old Opry, a great cultural, iconic institution, the center of country and western music since 1925. Uh, and in those days, they frequently featured a wonderful comedian named Cousin Minnie Pearl. I'm glad uh, many of you, not all audiences remember Cousin Minnie Pearl. Most do. She was the one that had the straw hat with the price tag still on it. And, uh, her real name was uh, Mrs. Sarah Cannon, and she was a very uh, refined and wonderful, uh, highly educated woman. And yet uh, the character she played, Cousin Minnie Pearl, was from Grinder's Switch, Tennessee. And she had a unique country persona. She used to greet her audiences with her trademark howdy. <laughs> And uh, on the radio that evening, she told a story that I used to tell it all the time, and I haven't told it uh, until this recent exchange that I recalled for you, but I almost drove off the road. She told a story about uh, a farmer who was involved in an accident, and he sued for damages, and the uh, person driving the other vehicle hired a lawyer, and this lawyer cross-examined the farmer and got him on the witness stand and said, now isn't it true that immediately after this accident you said, I feel fine? And the farmer said, well, it's not that simple. You see, I was driving my cow to town in the back of my truck and this feller came driving across the center line and the lawyer said, wait a minute, Your Honor, we're in the middle of a trial here. He turned back to the farmer and he said, just answer the question yes or no. Did you or did you not say, immediately after the accident, I feel fine? And the farmer said, well, I was leading up to that. <laughs> you see, I was driving my cow to town. <laughs> this fellow came driving across the center line and ran right smack dab into my truck and knocked it over. Threw me out, threw the cow out. I was on one side and the cow was on the other. Highway Patrolman came up and took one look at that cow and said, mm, she is suffering. Pulled out his gun and shot her right between the eyes. Came around to my side of the truck and said, how do you feel? The point of the story is that the alternative 
to, to making the outcome at Copenhagen ultimately successful is simply unacceptable. We have to solve this crisis. But before I talk more about that crisis and, and about uh, uh, this book, Our Choice, A Plan to Solve the Climate Crisis, I want to uh, take a few moments to express what's in my heart and I know in yours about the, uh, the tragedy and the suffering uh, that have uh, befallen the people of Haiti. Now, it is almost unimaginable in its uh, magnitude and uh, it, words can't adequately convey what we feel, much less what they are going through. And I simply want to acknowledge that and urge uh, all of you to help in uh, the, every way uh, possible and of course the new uh, digital tools for contributing and helping in a variety of ways are uh, available to us. Um, I, I work with a young woman who is a Haitian American and she has already uh, lost uh, several family members and some 20 of her family members are still unaccounted for. And throughout the Haitian diaspora in the United States, there are many similar stories, too many. And the, uh, one of the secrets of the human condition uh, is that suffering binds us together. And when we uh, feel our connection to those who are undergoing such agony, uh, we, we feel for them and we feel connected to them. In many ways, uh, this climate crisis uh, also calls upon us to feel the connection that we have to those who will come after us. Because the, the scientists have laid out for us in unmistakably clear terms what is happening on our planet right now. And though uh, some of those with uh, special interests, uh, monetary and political, uh, in not facing up to this crisis, have engaged in efforts to distort the truth and uh, intentionally sow confusion about what the scientific facts are. The scientific community has reached a consensus that is as strong as you will ever find in, in science. Going back to one 150 years. This is the 150th anniversary of two events that occurred the same year. The first oil well was drilled in Pennsylvania by Colonel Edwin Gray. He wasn't really a colonel, but that's another story. Um, but that same year, the great Irish scientist John Tyndall discovered that carbon dioxide uh, intercepts infrared radiation, in other words, traps heat. So the birth of the age of oil and the birth of climate science both date back uh, to the same inception, <laughs> the same year of inception. And one has outpaced uh, the other. But the fact that uh, CO2 and the other global warming pollutants trap heat in the atmosphere uh, is not really uh, disputable. Uh, it, it is a scientific fact. As I've said previously, it, it's like gravity. Uh, it exists. And efforts to pretend that it does not exist uh, will, of course, uh, uh, fail. But an open question is how long it will take for the implications of, of that knowledge to be used as the basis for intelligent action by humankind to reclaim control of our destiny. 